Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so, I am in particularly so excited to have Dan here with us because he is the guru of CRMs. If you don't know what a CRM is, it's a, um, I can't remember. I have one. I've been in several and I, they drive me nuts. And Dan's going to tell you why they drive you nuts. I can't remember what it's a management something. Customer management. relations management. Yeah, yeah customer definitely. client relations. Yeah, right, those yes. are the two. Things that it's sometimes all, come out. Yes, it's all about you running this program that keeps you in touch with your clients, with your customers, with any leads you have, your friends, however you want to set it up, you get to choose how you want to set it up and then what is the purpose of it and how you use it. And I, we have been in this one for a little over about a year and a half and um, it still drives me crazy because I'm not a tech person. I need somebody that will do it for me. So take it away, Dan. All right, great. And I'll share my screen as well. And uh, it was funny because I was thinking about, okay, so i got like 15 minutes to go through here. So let's throw some stuff up here and go like, all right, well, I, is that going to be enough? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we're gonna, there's going to be a lot. So anyway, so I'm Dan Freidenberg. I don't usually like talking about myself. Uh, Real Estate is a Scam is a site that I bought and I use it to basically say, these are the things from a digital security background that uh, I thought, well, that's not a level playing field. So, and I ended up writing a book about that, but you know, yeah, that's a headshot from some of the books there. But uh, yeah, most of, most importantly for me is being a dad. But anyway, what kinds of businesses need a CRM setup? And my tongue in cheek answer is ones that don't want to go out of business. Uh, basically, uh, if, all businesses are about acquiring customers and then uh, sharing the value that you have to offer with them. Uh, then going to your return customers, people who've already worked with you, already know who you are, that re-engagement is going to be uh, most of your business. And CRMs of their different forms, uh, they all do that. So that brings me to the next question that I figure most people would ask somebody just by looking at the topic here, you know, okay, Dan Fradenberg is a CRM guy. So it's how can you tell if a CRM is good or bad? Uh, and, and basically, I want to put that in the context here of uh, uh, what, what are the corners we don't want to paint ourselves into? And really, there are two. There are two big things that uh, jump out to me for if a CRM is good or bad. The uh, first one that you don't want to paint yourself into uh, is uh, you when you join a CRM, moving to another one is going to be very difficult. Uh, every single CRM, they'll have some sort of systems in place to make it where you, you know, uh, what's it, you can check in, but you can't leave or something like that. I forgot how, how that saying goes, but uh, yeah. one of the biggest guardians for making sure that you stick around uh, with your CRM is uh, the requirement for double opt in as a practice. So really the CRM, it's about your mail list, your emailing list, so you're emailing the people uh, in your CRM, but uh, uh, the double opt in part, it has to do with first when they sign up, you know, you know, here, get your free, whatever, you know, ebook or webinar registration, something like that, you end up signing up. And then uh, a double opt-in requires there's a, an email sent to you. It says, hey, were, was that even real? Like we just got notified by, that somebody used this email and wanted us to email them back. Is that a real thing or is it fake news? And then they'll have a nice little link for you to click to say, it's like, no, I know what this is. This is something I want. Or no, this person's a spammy so-and-so and I want them out of my life forever and ever. So uh, that's a double opt-in. And when you're on the inside, they say, oh, well, everybody does that. And as soon as you're on the outside, you realize that nobody does that whatsoever. Nobody does double opt-in. That's absolutely crazy because having the goodwill 
of somebody enough for them to even, you know, open up your emails at all. You know, that that's a big ask. Okay. But asking them to waste their time, clicking on some email, looking through their stuff. It's like, what if they're on vacation? You know, like what if they're at, they're physically at a conference or something like that? They don't want to dig through their inbox. So that's uh, uh, one corner that you might paint yourself into. And then the other one is, uh, do you have any intention of selling anything ever? That's the question that people don't ask themselves when they're picking a CRM. So they'll pick an active campaign or a MailChimp or something like that. But then once they realize, oh, but I want to sell tickets to my conference or I want to sell a free plus shipping offer for my new book, then you start to have a problem of communication between the services that actually uh, accept the transaction and the automated emailers. So you get a shopping cart CRM instead, which is what I worked for. Okay. So the, the advantage there is that if you have a MailChimp outage, but your shopping cart is still fine. Well, if you've got an event, it's like, well, how do you get around that? How do you put in redundancies, which for my career, until I got into this stuff, you know, redundancies were a bad thing and now they're wonderful. You know, that, that's what gets you out of hot water is redundancies. So one of them is that if something goes down, how do you make sure that your business can still make money? So having a shopping cart uh, CRM is the other corner that you don't want to paint yourself into. Uh, as far as recommendations on shopping cart CRMs, I'd rather discuss that privately instead of right here. So the next question that I'd probably be asked is what kinds of data require additional responsibilities, okay? So CRMs are supposed to be storing your list, but if it's storing your list, you wanna have the notes about the different people who are in your list. They have to be easily accessible. Whatever information you wanna find out about them, it should be right at your fingertips. So what kind of data will get you in trouble? Well, the guideline I can tell you to, to pair it to whoever your developer of choice uh, or your architect of your CRMs and funnels, uh, the, the one liner is uh, don't ask unless you absolutely need it. Okay. Don't ask for anything you don't need. Okay. So in a lot of CRMs, it'll have a field specially designated for social security number. And there is no circumstance I can think of whatsoever where you should use that, <laughs> okay? It, you should not be storing social security numbers inside a CRM. I don't, it's like, that's not how you should be doing it. You know, like I, I'd want to have a separate uh, client only software. So it's not all put in there. I, I, don't, I don't see the point from a security uh, standpoint. But as far as uh, the types of data where you need to know a little bit more in order to do your CRM stuff, one is uh, the, uh, the one related to health facts about yourself, the HIPAA. Uh, so that one's a pretty easy one. PCI compliance is another one, and that has to do with how to handle credit card numbers. Okay. So uh, like one of the restrictions is that uh, if you have physical copies of credit card numbers, they have to be stored in locked drawers in a locked room. Okay. That's like, or, and if you fail to do that, then you'll get a fine from your merchant account. And uh, the, the three digit code on the back of most uh, credit cards, but the four numbers on the front of Amex, those will land you like mucho fan, uh, fines. Uh, the last ones I've heard, you know, they could be like two to 5k per number for storing that. Okay. So, so PCI compliance, it has teeth. It's uh, it, it's, it's something that's a, a real thing. GDPR is more of a European union thing and it's a pain in the butt. A lot of Americans end up just saying, it's like, Hey, you're in Europe. So no. <laughs> what? And, uh, but the, the real trick about that is uh, right to delete. So having a system in your CRM where uh, you can delete people who are in Europe and say, I want you to pretend like we, I never existed uh, that's the hassle of uh, GDPR. 
And then, of course, the last one, my favorite, of course, because I got the 506 beaming on my screen, is uh, in syndication and uh, selling securities. Uh, there's going to be some situations where uh, you have to store like uh, people's net worths, uh, like there's other sensitive uh, things in there. And then there's the actual 506B part of uh, how do you actually prove you had that prior substantive relationship. So the next question, and I know that uh, it's been pretty heavy so far, so I apologize about that. But uh, the question that I'd want to know, especially the cynic in me, is uh, do CRMs make marketers' lives better and that's it? Uh, or is there something else uh, to it? And, and the way that I was thinking about it, that I was able to soften the blow a little bit here, is that um, I think that with a lot of small businesses, it's easy to justify the expense of having uh, like a CMO, a full-time marketer, something like that. But when it comes to setting up this sort of stuff, I, like, I find that the connection is not quite there yet for a whole lot of people. And, and so, and, but if you actually understand the background, then you'd be basically like, wait a second, are marketing people's jobs just to get me as a business owner excited to do something? And then the marketer just turns around to a tech person to implement whatever we decided that, oh, that's what we just have to do. If you're aware of that piece of information is like, okay, so if I've got space for one six figure guy, is it the tech one or is it the marketing one? You know, and, and like, what does it look like? And, and that's really what I was uh, coming from here. And, and I don't really have a fantastic answer for you on that one, because at the end of the day, you know, like marketing, it's like they are hype people. And that's a tough, that's a tough one to, to come out of. And I've always been a little bit cynical about it because when it comes to tech, if the stuff works, you know, you can just go ahead and put your credit card in, you punch in the thing, you know, hey, look, I got an email with my ebook in it. Hey, it works. Whereas like marketing, it's like, okay, well, we had, you know, 15% uh, lower show up rate. Uh, why exactly did we get such bad numbers on this broadcast compared to others? You know, the, the marketers have to come up with an answer for that. And it's, it's probably a little bit more subjective or, you know, oh, well, everybody, I guess, wanted to be outside during 4th of July this year, but, you know, they were more shut in the year before. So maybe that's why it didn't do as well this year, different things like that. So I just wanted to draw attention uh, in the CRM context of like, you know, is it worth having somebody who is focused full time in your business uh, on CRMs or is it the kind of thing where you can get, you know, like fractional, uh, you know, part time help, you know, virtual assistance or, or things like that. And that gets really into the conversation that Peggy and I, uh, we were having right before this, which is about um, how like having somebody who can put all the pieces together, it's a real challenge to find them. So uh, it's really a matter of just knowing the different seats at the table on the C-suite. But anyway, the next question uh, specifically about CRMs has to be when can the CRM itself become a bottleneck? That'll also reveal like when you've grown too big for a CRM. And, uh, and the way I'm framing that in there is uh, when you have the budget, where, is it, where should it go? And uh, the first thing is uh, any CRM is going to be really strict with its emailing spam policies. OK, because mm -hmm. they are sharing their servers with all of their clients. And so it's really easy for their servers to get a bad reputation because of some dummies who buy a list and try and import it and then, you know, get flagged for spam. The good thing is that's kind of going away to some degree. OK, uh, it, basically, the email providers are getting a little bit more savvy. So your own reputation actually will have a lot more to do with your deliverability than uh, just the CRM. But that's neither here nor there. So uh, one problem, though, is uh, you're, you're also definitely going to have to hit certain like open rates criterias to stay in the good graces of your CRM. And so you're only going to be able to email the engaged part of your list. OK, and uh, uh, what that means is uh, if, if they're not opening your emails and of course, there's some weirdness with with Apple products um, that I haven't heard the behind the scenes on it for for right this second. But um, 
basically, uh, if, if you're not calling your list, if you're just emailing your entire list and you're not reducing the number based on who's actually engaged, who's actually interested in your stuff, then you're going to get penalized. And you're going to get booted off of your CRM. Okay. So that's a little bit of a problem. And so what people do though, is they say, well, what about the crowd where I still want to throw a Hail Mary and I still want to mail them, even though I don't want to get messed up with the CRM. Okay. In that kind of situation, you'd get your own managed email uh, server service through a software that connects with the different uh, farms you can get. Like we worked with one that was out in Europe and uh, had good uh, success with that. But uh, that would be, they'd be the ones who would be putting their, their fingers on the pulse of, you know, like what's Microsoft saying about our email? What's Google saying about our email? What's AOL saying about our email? And then giving us feedback as far as like, okay, we need to email fewer people that are with this provider and all this stuff that just gives you a headache. So that's where you'd spend some money. Um, other than that, you know, it might be like other organization, but you know, CRMs in general won't be the limiting factor. Uh, you can save all kinds of wild stuff. So to finish up, why are you, why are you freakishly good at this Dan Fradenberg? Uh, you know, if I can't afford you and want to hire the next best thing, what are the interview questions? Framing that in a little bit. Uh, my biggest thing is that I actually studied electrical engineering. So I actually know how the gadgets work. And so what will happen in tech pretty frequently is you'll spend, you'll waste a ton of time trying to say, okay, how do we do this? And you'll end up on a wild goose chase, just trying to find a solution for the problem that's come up. And because they don't understand how servers work and they don't understand how client side programming works and they don't understand how server side programming works and, you, you know, the IT and all that kind of stuff then you know you'll end up wasting time in development while they're trying to you know they're going on a wild goose trace you know uh, there's no pot of gold at the end of this rainbow so uh so the re so that's one reason why uh with crms why i'm good at this stuff is because i know what the actual hardware and software is capable of doing and i custom code so i got popular because of my custom coded api integrations so uh, the question of, uh, you know, if you can't afford me and you want to hire the next best thing, uh, like what are the interview questions? Like, well, one part would be a full stack developer for me personally, but as far as the CRM architect goes, you could, uh, you could pick basically any CRM out there. And um, there's, there's a large community of freelancers who'd be able to help you out. But uh, the role that I think you'd still want to include me on is just uh, getting the funnels and the ideas uh, out and executed. And then also make sure that uh, if people are gonna try and take you for a ride uh, in terms of um, uh, just uh, uh, getting, you know, like what do they call it? Like pork barrel projects or some things, just stuff where it's, there's not actually that much to do but uh, they're still going to make you pay through the nose. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I'd be able to put a pin in if you want to just uh, work with me on a short basis. Wow, that's fantastic. And boy, do I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, well, the good stuff about this is uh, I'm ready. <laughs> I've uh, been asked a lot of questions on this subject. Well, yeah, you went through a lot of stuff really fast. And uh, because you went through so many things fast, I don't know if everybody actually understood everything yeah. you talked yeah. about. Uh, um, yeah, so we, I did not ask any questions. I didn't ask the right questions. Let's say that. As you said, when you talk, when you speak to a CRM company, they'll tell you they can do anything for you. And then I signed up with Salesforce. They didn't let me have any kind of experience with them before I signed up. They took my money and then they dropped me and left me on my own. And 
What I told them before I signed up was I am not tech savvy. I need a system that's already in place. Mm -hmm. So basically they lied to me because you have to create your own system in Salesforce. You have to write it yourself. You have to really be a programmer to work in Salesforce. So I got out of that and then I just started talking to different CRM companies because I know we needed something because when you have a, when you have a group of five or six or seven people, we all have our own people. We need to have a place where we could track everything. So I talked to different companies and I explained what we did because we don't work like most people work. We don't have a product we sell. We work with, we're a middleman. So we have two sides that we work with and most CRMs don't know how to do that. They pretty much work the shopping cart. You've got a product, you're selling a product. That's not how we work. So it took a long time to, and I talked to companies and I told them what we did. And they actually, when I found some good people to talk to, they said, we can't help you. We, we, we don't, we can't set you up that way. And then I finally found this one group funnel maker. And they said, look, we know how to work with you because I talked to the person I talked to was an actual entrepreneur mm -hmm. right. salesperson. So he understood what, when I explain what our company does, he understood it. And he said, okay, I, this is, we will have to work with you, but we could set it up. So it works for you. So we've mm -hmm. been with them for about a year and a half. And, you know, we have a lot of challenges. I have a lot of challenges anyway, because tech savvy is not my thing. And I get hundreds of emails every day and I have to get back to them. And it took, uh, took us a while to figure out how we could get when it comes into our Gmail, how it could go back into the funnel maker. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to copy and paste everything into it. So we could have a, so you have a conversation going with someone, write an email. Well, if you delete your one, and if you don't download that into your funnel maker, you don't have that part. So it took a yeah. while for us to figure out how to do things and they've been very helpful. But then there are things that we just really feel, I feel very challenged about. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, it's really not the best use of my time either. That's why I'd really like to find like a, a virtual assistant and have her or him be the person that I could just send an email and say, create this email or to, to, to the clients or to the prospects or to, to whom, or, or to the sponsors or to whomever it is that we're working with. Mm -hmm. um, what I, right. Really, yeah. And we don't so deal about, with credit cards. We don't said. have social security. So we don't really have a security problem because we don't mm -hmm. have a shopping cart. Right. Well, we do collect right. information uh, from investors. So what do we do? We do collect some information from investors. Yes, yeah. but not that kind of information. Not social securities, I, not credit uh, cards, not sometimes sometimes net worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's sensitive, but it's not uh, you know highly sensitive in the sense of uh, you know if it's compromised, it's like a little bit of pie in your face. But it's not like you've left themselves you've left them vulnerable to identity theft. That's uh, that's the one that's the big, you know, everything's on fire. Everything needs to be <laughs> fixed right now. But uh, there, there was a, one other thing that I, I wanted to back up that you uh, just mentioned there, uh, Peggy, which is um, one of the issues you're going to run into. You know, you, you were talking about having that virtual assistant who can help you. Uh, you, you know, you just say, okay, send out this broadcast of this little list uh, right there. So uh, that virtual assistant in general will be great at the science of doing that. Uh, but the art of that job role in between you and it getting accomplished is uh, finding out some way to discern who should be getting the email and who shouldn't. And that's the art of uh, list segmentation. And so uh, the, where that's really going to come in and then have a, you know, Dan shaped hole in it, it's uh, for setting up the forms so that you're absolutely certain if they showed up and they use this page, then they must be this person. So they will have these appropriate tags on them so that next time we need to know, all right, this person, you know, like they, they've spent more than 
$997 on our products, you know, or they bought like a high level coaching or they bought whatever it is we'd know and we'd be able to get that list fast, fast, fast. So if we've got somebody who's a whale as far as uh, reputation goes and, you know, they have time in an hour and a half to hop on a live streaming call and we need to, you know, make that happen like right now. Well, we've got a way to do that. So that's, that's the fun of, of having somebody on staff who's ready to do that level of tracking. Mm -hmm. So, so I suppose that's the other thing I didn't mention in CRMs, which are one of the main parts of shopping cart uh, CRMs. It's the affiliate modules. So that way, if you have people who you want to pay commission when they refer a sale, then it does all that tracking for you and gives the dashboard to them so that they know that uh, if they're sending traffic your way, it's not just a black hole of saying like, oh yeah, no, it wasn't going that well. Meanwhile, you're sitting there going money, 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 because you sold a bunch without them knowing. So the more uh, transparency you have for that in the affiliate module, the CRM, the better affiliate relationship you'll have with the people who uh, send you business. Yeah, so that's the other. those people a lot. Yeah. So anybody have questions? Y'all are running your own businesses. Are y'all all in CRMs of some sort? I noticed- I'm doing an SMS campaign with a phone numbers. Would that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, some of them have it. So like, well, the, the other thing is my role as, uh, as CTO, it was also about uh, cost mitigation right which is that like what is the way that like long term uh is the most cost effective so the typical way you'll get integrated in a crm with uh with sms messaging uh it'll probably you know and this might have gone in the last couple of years that i wasn't aware of but uh, there was a cost of about three grand to open uh, an account so that you can start uh, sending sms's but uh, that's from the typical services, but there's some other ones out there that, uh, you know, if you can get in with them, then they, they won't cost anywhere near that much. And uh, what I ended up doing for the Ohio firm I worked for for six years is uh, I did an API integration between our CRM and the uh, texting service. So they didn't have an integration. So I just made one. And, uh, and, you know, we probably sent out, you know, like 40,000 texts over the time I was there. Uh, you know, like, I know we were doing 5 million emails a month, like clockwork, like the entire time. So like that was, uh, yeah, as far as numbers go, like, like I might be understating the number of SMSs by a long shot, but uh yeah. So, so anyway, so yeah, it, it's definitely possible and uh, they have integrations on it. It's the only question is like, um, you know, like what's your budget? Is it going to price you out? Cause uh, I, like I was also mentioning having your own mail server, you know, like that's when you can justify, you know, like roughly 1200 a month, you know, uh, just for your email guys to keep track of your, uh, of your sending. And that'd be on about a quarter million contact list so I, I don't think we get charged for the sms we get charged for phone calls because they record the call so if you're on a call for 45 minutes it's going to cost you a few bucks but our sms because we use that every week to notify to remind people about the show we um we don't get charged for that and we send out texts mm -hmm. all the time it was it's built right into our to the one we're using mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a, oh, cool. Here we go. To the rest scale, like proof. Money in other ways. Yeah, Twilio, yeah. Yeah. Twilio. That's, uh, that's the one that I heard had a $3,000 setup fee, but, Ooh. uh, you know, my information isn't as recent for that stuff because I've been doing podcasts with investors, syndicators, and operators of commercial real estate. So weird. SMS. Much more fun. <laughs> For sure. 
<laughs> I, I actually find that uh, uh, they tend to be smarter and uh, more sociable. And, and that's, those are two of my favorite traits in a person. So there you go. Let's see what other questions, Ethan? Dan, what do you think of uh, Podio? Have you had a, an experience with that? Uh, yeah, I messed around with it a little, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me personally is, uh, like, I don't really go gaga over systems in general, because I know that I can program them from scratch when I need to. And so, uh, yeah, it, like really like so much of what you see in software is just to try and get you to interact with the computer in a way that makes sense to a programmer, you know, and, and makes sense to you graphically or whatever. But once you've already made that jump, you know, it doesn't have to be pretty, <laughs> you know? So, so, so really that's uh, so, so Podio, it, it wasn't anything, nothing jumped out at me as far as like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen. But um, you know, like if I were to say like any particulars, like, like a, like anything that comes to mind that separates one CRM from another, like uh, the one that uh, Infusionsoft or Keep, uh, it's called Confusionsoft uh, by a lot of people. And, and honestly, um, the truth is it's sloppy. It's not confusing, it's sloppy. They do the exact same thing in different ways all over the application. <laughs> Yeah. And so as a result, it makes, you know, yeah, it, it's like driving in Montreal. It's terrible. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, with, but at least with Infusionsoft, the one thing that I could never say bad about it is if you mess up like really, really bad and you're using Infusionsoft, it, about 95% of the time, there's some really slow, meticulous way that you can undo what you messed up. Whereas other ones, it'd be a 0% chance that you could uh, go back and, and fix your mistake. So I'm thinking about like deleting contacts or, you know, like uh, overwriting some sort of contact information, you know, uh, accidentally, things like that. You can usually get your way out of it in Infusionsoft. And that's like one thing to look out for. So. So Carrie uses Morse. What do you like about it? Morse, I haven't used it. Uh, Morse Connect uh, for our SMS. Oh. And it can be responsive. So if you've got a salon and you need to make appointments, it's got AI, that kind of thing. So. Okay, so yeah, messenger chatbots and stuff like that. See you then. Okay. Gotcha. Does that have a shopping cart in it? Not specifically. We have there are other ways to connect that. Okay. Thank you for sharing. So I guess uh, since you bring up the shopping cart part again, the question might come up. It's like, well, why not just have PayPal or, you know, something similar to PayPal? And uh, the biggest answer is because of transaction fees. So with PayPal, you're paying enormous amounts. Whereas if you actually have a merchant account, and with that merchant account, you have a payment gateway through a service like authorized.net. Okay, you're going to be paying, you know, like up to like 4% less. So like, it's like, it's big number difference. So like, like getting a 2.1% transaction fee, like, uh, you know, I haven't been pricing it recently, but like, it, it's that, that's not absurd from what I've run into. And of course, uh, you can negotiate more and more. But you know, if you're in something tangible, they like that a lot more. Because like with coaching, it's like, oh, did you receive the coaching or not? And so, so that's the only thing that you also have to be aware of. But uh, I transact, yeah. Dan, for um, yep. syndication, what kind of questions should we actually have in our CRM? What, what information should we be capturing? Okay, so uh, the C the uh, securities attorneys that I've run into, uh, they match a lot of the same questions as if uh, you're doing one on one coaching for hire. Uh, most of it has to do, and and of course, like I'm not an attorney, and I'm just telling you what uh, I've studied and memorized and all that kind of stuff because it's something I do. <laughs> the uh, the questions on the questionnaire, actually, I, I now because I've 
in my in my spare time, I've been taking some law courses online here, uh, just without any of the tests or that, that kind of nonsense. Because law and, is so uh, much fun. Oh right. Well, it, well, I think the biggest part that I keep on, you know, like that all of it seems to be missing is the amount of latitude that judges actually have. And I think that a lot of, you know, uh, the wishy-washiness you detect in attorneys is reflective of that, right? And, and, and it's not, you don't really want to be saying it that way where a judge can hear you. So that's why it's like, I, well, at least I get to say it. But. So, uh, yeah, so, so really um, the, uh, the questions they ask on that questionnaire, it has to do with uh, how long you've been uh, investing what asset classes you've already invested in uh i also saw uh there's one part like uh, well there's one that's uh, asking about uh, the features of an investment that you'd prioritize in other I, words do you prefer cash on cash or irr would be the simplest way of saying it but uh you know like so i remember it had like four options on that one um but uh, uh, then uh, on top of that, the other questions were, uh, I hate the one on, um, on risk, which is like, do you, are you very aggressive with your risk or do you only like a little bit of risk sprinkled on top of your investment Sunday? Uh, you know, and, and uh, so, so those, that was the tone of it. And it was basically to get an idea of like, how much of this stuff have you done? And, and the thing that I've got on the go with 506 B me is what I see as when I read the actual policy that's put out by the SEC and the way that they phrase it, you know, it's called like, okay, so they're really looking for verification that, you know, the level of sophistication. And I do not think that that questionnaire covers that one little bit especially because Apple's already taught us to scroll to the bottom and hit I accept. And school has taught us that if we think we're not going to get in because we put in the wrong answer, we could just, yeah, just shift the details a little, you know, right? And so, yeah, I don't trust a questionnaire, especially one where the only evidence, like from a tech perspective, when you fill in a form, they don't know it's you, okay? They know your IP address, they know the contents of your submission. They know the details of the device that you're on. They could tell if you use that device in the past. So that's really what, what pins it on. Okay, that was totally the person. But in general, they don't have something like, okay, this person's logged in with Google on this account. They did it with voice recognition or biometric verification, two-factor verification, you know, like all this stuff. This is the dude. That stuff just doesn't exist. Okay, so that's an Achilles heel that I don't think many people are looking at. And so me uh, with, um, you know, I got this uh, friend for 20 years who's a shrink. So I'm going like, okay, between that and my teaching experience, how can I really make sure where it's like, no, I was really upfront that, you know, this is illiquid. Okay, I'm not going to tell you this unless you really get it. And I have to have a legitimate circumstance to be meeting you other than pitching you deals. And I'm sticking my neck out by being a, a social media person. So I'm jumping out and I'm a little of what I'm saying there is more talking to you, Cliff, than, you know, other listeners, just because you know a little bit more of the background, right? But, um, but how do you prove you know somebody's level of sophistication in a CRM? I'd argue that you can't. But uh, I got definitely the next best thing because I show people how a deal works. I get the guest to say which role of those six roles they intend on actually following through on. What are their core competencies that make them capable in that situation? You know, what exactly are they looking for and why are they doing it? And I think that that's a much better answer, especially if I have um, a digital signature or something like that as well. So so that's the answer of what I don't think CRMs can do. And that's also why I built 506 BME. What kind of digital signature are you utilizing um, in your questionnaire? Are you using like just a typed name? Is that sufficient or do you actually use like DocuSign? Uh, yeah, I, it's, I've, I've got right now, I've got it where it's uh, integrated with whatever you want. And then the backup is uh, I actually have a way 
without uh, uh, leaving security vulnerabilities of, uh, of storing your actual signature. You know, those really rudimentary, you know, you use your finger on the tablet or, you know, uh, those sorts of things. I've got a way of saving that that's actually not a huge security risk. Because like that's one of the problems is like you, you can't be saving copies of people's signature. Like even if you're capable of doing it, you should not be doing it under any circumstance, like, like ethically and otherwise. It's a terrible, terrible idea. But I have a way of doing it where no human is like you're going to like I've seen them. And you look at it, it's like, I don't care if you're a savant, you won't be able to read this and say, oh, OK, I can forge the signature now. <laughs> Now, when you mean storing right. a signature, you're talking about like a digital yeah. storage of a signature. Yeah, I'm talking. Well, I got, I got a, I got a drawing tablet right here, so I'd be able to actually go on it, and then it'd be my real signature in every way, shape, and form. But, but sometimes people won't have that. Sometimes they'll have to use a mouse, to, so it's still a mark. You're like you're, you as uh, your attorney background, you're word, you're aware that any mark you make, like if you want to sign with an X, you can go right ahead. You know, was that your mark? Yes. <laughs> was that your mark? Uh, I don't think so. I don't recall. <laughs> so there you go. I, I'm, 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 I'm giving the Adiola a good time at least. So me and him, we got this. This is good. So if you sign on a portal, whether yeah. it's a DocuSign, not a real signature, but a printed signature, are they not supposed to keep your signature? I mean, how are they going to prove that it was supposedly you that filled out the document? Yeah, there's a good chance that they're doing the same thing that I am. Uh, Cause like, there's only so many ways you can input it. And, and then the real important part is just making sure it's encrypted. Is that, know, the, is the, that Yeah, the, the law is actually says that it only has to be obfuscated. It's, it's like, if, it, if you can just like see it with your naked eye and no technology, then you're in deep trouble. But other than that, it's, you're fine. So when you when you hire a portal like Monday, are they the ones that actually encrypt it? Yes, and they'd also uh, securely store all the data uh, okay. on their system. They're in compliance. Yeah. And you, and you could hire a company like that and not be concerned that you're out of compliance. Uh, well, no unfortunately and and that's why you know like attorneys love to say it's like well it's it's you know it's not that simple or you know it depends that's the that's the big one it depends and uh so so there's a lot of things that uh that crm developers they just plain weren't thinking of like they just weren't expecting people to be using that that way and and that's actually how i was able to afford the have kids and all that kind of fun stuff is because I'd always be like, well, I know how it's supposed to work, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about how will it work and how I can make that outcome trigger something else super duper weird that uh, will make the user experience absolutely amazing. So, but I've gotten into the weeds so much on technical things. I'm not going to geek out on that one. <laughs> Okay. So, so the people that hire you are, who are they? Who are the kinds of people that hire you? We'd like to yeah, know so, who, who makes a good referral. Sure. So, uh, so as of 11 years ago, it was always uh, any seven figure online business. Uh, they'd at least have the foundation where I'd really be fuel to the fire as opposed to just another person to just do grunt work. Uh, but uh, since 2014, it's been specifically for real estate uh, company owners. Uh, so uh, six of those was for single family. But uh, for the last couple of years, it's all been uh, commercial real estate. And uh, what the people I've been wooing are uh, sponsors who need somebody with my skill set, which also includes the content creation and marketing for social media. Uh, I'm basically throwing my hat in the ring of saying, hey, I got a really weird skill set that's super duper useful, but not one you generally think of when you're thinking of your GP team taking down commercial deals. But let's do this anyway. So that's uh, that's who I've been wooing in general. 
and uh, just talking to uh, syndicators, you know, KPs, those are, those are the best people for uh, me to talk to. Well, maybe Ethan could help you because he's a KP. He, he might know yep. people that would be good referrals. At trying yep. to find the time when he's not working, that would be the biggest challenge because we don't know if he ever stops or if he ever sleeps. So every time we see him, he's working. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, just this weekend, Ethan and I started uh, recording a course on uh, commercial real estate investment for attorneys. Oh. So that's an interesting thing. It's already going. You know, I, I think it's a, a nice slam dunk for uh, somebody who fits Ethan's description where, you know, he's not a, a guru with a mastermind of, you know, 18 people who've all paid them so paid him so that, you know, like he pretends that he's interested in whatever it was that they offered. I'm kind of pointing my finger at click funnels and that whole community there. If you're not reading that one, but mm. that's, that's the problem in general with coaches. I find is that, you know, they basically hype everybody up. Oh yeah. We're going to be super duper successful because we're going to be super duper motivated and make sure you pay the 10 grand for this next year and <laughs> it's just hold up and it's like oh yeah and we've been talking about commercial real estate i want my friend to come up here to talk about nutrients and and stuff like that i, I i'm 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 not going to a health a health conference and real estate one can, can, can we talk about deals cliff what's on your mind yeah. So, I mean, my mindset around a CRM is, you know, if, if you have a business and you don't have a CRM, then you really don't have a successful business because once you get past about seven clients, you, you start having things fall through the cracks and you lose track of what you're supposed to be doing and, and who you're supposed to be communicating with. Um, so, you know, I, I'm definitely a believer in it. You said something though earlier, if I understood it correctly, that I just want some clarification on. Um, you had stated that, you know, at what point does a CRM become a bottleneck in a company? And then what do you do about that? So maybe I missed your response on that, but can you clarify that a little bit more? Okay. So, uh, sure. So one point where it'd be a bottleneck would be, uh, when you, your list is like, you know, if you're a more established business, you've got a, a much larger list but they're just not engaged, but you still want to engage with them periodically. Uh, and you want to have that infrastructure to, to basically throw those Hail Marys. Uh, and, and the thing that um, is kind of interesting, and I was, I failed to do this uh, like while I was purely a tech, but now that I got deeper into real estate, the relationships I've got with these, uh, these different email providers is kind of interesting because I can tell them behind the scenes that, you know, like the ways that real estate people are completely different. Okay. So like, for example, like if you buy a list, okay, that's the cardinal sin in email deliverability. Okay. Just if you try and just buy somebody's list and import it, okay. It's like, go away. You're a spammer. You should be ashamed of yourself. You know, that's kind of the CRM reaction. But uh, if you can, if you actually have an independent mail campaign, what? Yeah, right, right. Like, like if I buy but, a uh, list to just direct mail them first and then have them connect with us, either through a landing page or, or direct. Right. And, and that's where I'm going when it comes to real estate is it's like it's a different breed of person. OK, like they're like the thing that uh, the Googles are, are of this world are slapping people for it's it's because they're engaging people who don't care. And, and like that's what spamming actually is. But if they're actually engaged, that's the that's the behavior that they actually watch. Right. So they're saying it's like, OK, so when when somebody sends an email, do they open it? You know, yes or no. And, and if they don't, then it's like, okay, this person's obviously not providing enough value. So this one goes into the abyss, but this one goes into the inbox, you know? So, so that's, that's what they end up uh, deciding. And um, yeah, it, it's really, it's really bizarre. Like I remember when I was working at web.com, my, uh, my director, you know, basically said, you know, yeah, you can get a diploma and email deliverability and you still won't get all of it. And uh, it's been simplified recently. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but email has become more expensive. 
uh, in the last uh, in the last few years, last three years or so. And part of that is uh, Gmail and Microsoft just really, you know, tightening their grip on it and making sure that one email belongs to one person and, and make it a lot more legally binding uh, as far as uh, its usage goes. And, and so like if you use the email address, you know, you can't, you're losing your plausible deniability. Hmm. Whereas before... You know, it could have been anybody. But if you set yourself up as as a business, those companies actually realize that you are a company and they work with you on that at least a little bit better than. Right, right. And like a lot of so much of it is pay to play now for that exact reason. Right. It, it, it's like basically you have to be funded and you have to, you know, buy a chunk of advertising even before your offer is really any good. And then everybody gets a bad taste in their mouth about PPC. They're like, oh, yeah, you could just waste tons of money on ads. It's like, well, if you have no idea what you're doing, then that's a certainty that you're going to waste a bunch of money on ads because uh it, it's an art it's not a science yes it so, is one more but, art. Uh, so cliff asked uh the next question was uh yeah what do you do when you have a bottleneck right and so uh so the first thing is uh you get your own email server uh that's managed by somebody else and you you do exactly what they tell you to that's uh, that's the first thing that you'd have as a bottleneck. So the other one, if you, uh, I, I think that's the reason why I gapped out on it. Uh, the the painting yourself into a corner one. I mentioned that if you don't have one that's integrated or or is also a shopping cart, then you're going to run into problems at some point because there's going to be they're, they're going to be transmitting information between each other, and every once in a while it won't work, and they'll be hell to pay. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it. Like especially for the sense, like ah, we just lost like twelve thousand dollars because this thing was gone. Ah, you know, and it's like I don't like they don't tell me. You, you can call them, and the people who answer the phone have no ability to connect with the IT department to find out the real reason. So that so the supervisor just made up their own answer and told us to feed it to all of you. And I'm just the person getting yelled at, sir. <laughs> right? That's that's the life of being a, a you know a, a tech support rep is being yelled at for stuff that you know nothing about and didn't cause and have zero input <laughs> on it getting changed. Yeah, so yeah. few people understand technology. Yeah. Right? It's not their expertise. Like ours, we're real estate experts. We know a lot about real estate. You, if I knew as much about technology as I do about real estate, I would own and be running Google. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't even know how to work on Google. So. Mm. Peggy just calls me. I do. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, I was the family's Google for quite some time, and then uh, now uh, the kids they Google my answers to see if Google knows the right answer. <laughs> so yeah earning that level of trust was a lot of work it, it took a lot of time to you know them asking a question i said well if you google it it'll say this but the real answer is this and then they google it and they say many people say it's this but the real answer is that they're like oh wow <laughs> so yeah in google it's it's, it's really edifying for your kids <laughs> that's great anybody else have a question for our wonderful, wonderful pre presenter today. Great. So yeah, Gary asked uh, how to reach me and uh, the best way would be through LinkedIn once my doodad here gets his act together. But would you also uh, share that see. previous page you shared that had your contact information? That way there's both. We've got one that'll be in yeah. chat for our, our viewers that are live with us and then one for people who are watching the replay. Okay, okay, share that screen. There it is. So how do I get this deck? Well, you can use your phone, you can scan that thing, or you can pull up your browser and you type up all that stuff. So but as far as that, that's cool. Yeah, copy, copy, and then 
where's my chat go? That's a, okay, I hit chat. And then I go oh, for everybody, paste and send. There you go. And it also mentions my meetup at noon Eastern on Tuesdays. That's for syndicators, operators. We even have passive investors there too. It's exciting stuff. It is exciting stuff. So Dan, thank you very much for your presentation today. It was great. Uh, I'm sure we all have a lot of questions for people who are not tech like me. I was a little above my head. And for people who want to be successful in their business, make sure you get the right CRM for your company. Please come back again. Thank you. Thank you.